Um, freshman sure. level double integral. Well, it's a freshman level. Yeah, sir. Just just briefly, let us indulge in a freshman level uh, uh, double integration class. Before we, you know, the idea here is that I got to remind you how double and triple integrals work, so that we can go on to the more interesting ideas, which are how you start integrating when vector fields are involved. So we want to talk about line integrals and integrals over vector fields because they correspond to interesting questions. But we can't do that unless we've got the basic computational technique, which is how do we how do we integrate a double integral? Okay. Um, in fact, uh, I, after I show you double integration, I can show you my favorite cheesy trick of all time. Um, probably not today, but we'll see. Okay, so let's look at a function like this. This is a typical example of how a double integral is calculated in practice. So suppose you have a function f of x y is three x y, and it's over. So this is a surface. This is chapter 5.2. This is the double integration chapter, 5.2, double integral. And we did 5.1. Yeah, we did 5.1 and 5.2. 5.1 is about what in inter, how to do an integrated integral, and 5.2 is how to do a double integral. But mostly it's reminding you guys how the technique works. So I thought a couple of examples would remind you more than me blathering about theory, even though I like the theory, but you know, when you're doing integrals, you have to be able to do them. So suppose that you have a surface uh, defined over a region D, which is bounded by uh, Y equals 32X to the third and uh, Y equals X. Okay. So this is kind of a calculus four idea that you would have seen a bunch. So I, I think we'll point something out about how this is done. So normally what you do over, over. yeah, over. So this is a domain contained in the X, Y plane. And then the function is evaluated to be a surface sitting over the top of it, right? So the D here is, this is short for domain. And what we're going to be computing is the double integral over d of f of x, y, d, a. And what we need to do is translate this into an appropriate iterated integral that I can actually compute is what we need to do. So in order to do that, I'm going to write this region down first. Hopefully, I remember my basic function theory. So y is equal to 32x to the third is going to be some kind of variant of this guy, I think. Y is equal to 32 x to the third up to scale. I mean, you know, plus or minus one having z values of, of 32 and root n. And then y equals root x is going to kind of come out and do this. And somewhere those curves are going to intersect each other. So what it's saying is this region right here is the region D. And you should think about the surface as living over the top of that in space. And we're trying to figure out the volume that's contained between this shape and whatever surface is sitting on top of it. Right? And in fact, this surface is some kind of hyperbolic uh, surface, I think, with the xy relationship. So, how, how do I do that? Do the point where intersect? Well, that would be a useful thing to do first. Okay, how, how do I do that? Oh, wait, I got one. I'll, I'll get this one. Thanks, that's the applause I was looking for. <laughs> okay, well now what? Can you solve for the lower end? Oh my god, how do I do that? You square both. Oh my god, oh, okay. And then everyone here gets like nervous because 32 squared, right? 32 squared x to the sixth is equal to x. Ooh. Okay, well now what? Okay, I'm gonna I forbid you. I forbid you from saying divide by x. Don't do that. Ah, oh, there we go. 32 squared. That's how lazy I am. 32 squared x to the sixth. I mean, what is this? Two to the tenth. There, that's even better. Two to the tenth, x to the sixth, minus x is equal to zero. So either x is equal, well, sorry, I should be one separator. X times two to the tenth x to the fifth minus one is equal to zero. So either x is zero or two to the tenth x to the fifth is equal to one, one. So x to the fifth is equal to one over two to the 10th. So x is equal to 
Right? Yeah. Yes. Ten divided by five is two. Can you take a fifth root? What's the fifth root of two to the tenth? Then two squared? Mm -hmm. I was thinking of two to the fifth for some reason. Oh yeah, no, no. So I think I think this is like if you take a fifth root of both sides, that's like multiplying by the one fifth power, and you end up with x is equal to one fourth. Okay. Zero, one fourth. Okay, that's it. We're ready to go. How do we set the integral up? Can we take a direction? Like dy dx? Yeah, so I got it. So, like, the idea here is the way I've set this thing up, notice I've got one function on top and another function on bottom that completely controls the area, right? Mm -hmm. And it's always consistently the same function on top and the same function on bottom. So, that should tell me what order I want to integrate, in. right? I are my are the values I've gotten here the numerical values x values or y values? X values. X values, right? Zero to one fourth. That should be my outer integral. My outer integral is going to be the integral that represents the numerical values that I have that describe the region. My inner integral should describe how I get from for a given value of x, how I get from here to here. For a given value of x, how I get from this curve up to that one. So the lower curve here is what is it, 32 x to the third, and the upper curve here is the x, and the function was just. So the process of setting these up is normally the difficulty is in trying to look at what's going on with these pictures, right? Figuring out what kind of region you're working in now. There's all this language in the book about type one integrals and type two integrals, and somebody's trying to get in the room here. Uh, type one integrals and type two integrals. Who cares about any of that, right? You can be guided by what information you have. So when I look at this, I think, well, if I was doing this as an area integral in calculus two, I would think I've got the same function consistently on top and the same function consistently on bottom which means that I could integrate from here to here. And the numerical values I got by finding the um, points of intersection are X values. So for a fixed X, I integrate from this curve to this one. And then as long as I integrate across all the X values, I'll be basically be able to chop the region up this way. Yep. So, in, in, for this one, you could do that. You could actually find the inverses. So this one, it could actually, so let's actually set it up the other way and see. It's a reasonable thing to do. So let's think about this region in the other way. Okay, suppose you look at that square root of X and you say to yourself, there's not a chance in hell I'm gonna get the square root of X. I'm gonna reformulate this problem in, in, in Y without realizing you're committing yourself to working with a cube root of Y instead of a, instead of a chance cube. So you say, okay, I don't want to do that. I want to do this function, which is, it used to be y is equal to 32x to the third, but now I'm going to write it as the cube root of y over 32 is equal to x. This function used to be y is equal to root x, but look, you've made your life so much easier by writing this as x is equal to y squared. But this works because the same function is always on the right and the same function is always on the left. So for a fixed value of y, you could go from here to here, which would mean that your inner integral, if you were thinking about it this way, for a fixed value of y, you would be integrating from this x value, or sorry, yeah, this x value to this x value. x, y. And this is a dx integral. And then you would have to surround that with the dy integral, where now you need to know the y coordinates of these intersections instead. You have to set those equal to each other. Well, zero to one fourth. I guess it's worth taking the time to actually do it. I mean, I guess we just plug one fourth into the equation, right? Mm -hmm. So uh, if x is one, it's one half, right? Is that the. Yeah. I cheated because I already knew the x value. Yep. So, uh, and the previous integral of the numeric margin of integration was where it goes. So, on this one, 
So I'll, I, 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 I didn't mean to erase the previous one. So let me write it back up here. So in this version, we have this because we're saying fix the value of y and integrate through x and then integrate through all of the y's. And in the other one, we had the integral from zero to one fourth and that was a dx integral. And then in the interior, we were integrating from root x to um, 32 x to the third dx, y, dy. So in this way of thinking about it, we're integrating from the bottom function to the top function and then integrating through all the x values. In this version, we're integrating from the left function to the right function and then integrating through all the y values. Um, oh, well, because I knew that the point of intersection here had x, x had an x value one fourth. Oh. And so if x is one fourth and y is equal to root x, then y must have been one half, right? So this point is actually going, this the actual value of that point is one fourth. Yep. Why do we put square root of x at the bottom? Because, um, oh, it should be backwards. All right, you're right. This should have been 32 x to the third. <laughs> Because the bottom function here, the, as I as I as I go this way, I think about integrating from the bottom to, to the top in a positively oriented way, right? So positive orientation goes from small to large, right? So bottom to top or left to right, so that your the positive orientation of integrals means you should be integrating in the positive direction. If possible. Okay. So in this particular problem, it doesn't really matter which way you do it. You're going to get a problem about the same difficulty. But sometimes it actually turns out, so this is an exhibition of what we mean by changing variables or changing order of integration. So this is the, actually the topic I was going to talk about today, which is how do you change the order of integration and why would you do it? So in this case, it doesn't seem like there's a lot of value to be gained from doing that, right? But this one, like, okay, fine, you're still having to deal with a square root and a cube root. None of this is really hard. The polynomial integral, I haven't gained much. Okay. Um, but notice it's not just as simple as flipping the order of integration and keeping the numbers the same, right? To actually do this, I had to transform the way I was thinking about the region. I had to transform the way I was thinking about the region from functions in X to functions in Y. In the book, these sort of regions are called type three regions. So a type three region is both type one. And so just to point out, if you read the book, type one are like this, where you've got the same function on top always, the same function on bottom always. And you always set these up so that you integrate the outer integral in X and the inner integral in Y. And this way of thinking about it is as a type two region where you have a function on the right and a function on the left. So type two regions always integrate. This is the this integral is a type two integral, and this integral is a type one integral. Type two integrals always correspond to integrating through x first and then integrating through y. Type one integrals correspond to integrating through y first and then integrating through x. And as if that region also happens, to, if it's full, then you can actually flip which way you're integrating by doing the sort of function transformation. Type of regions only have type one or type two. So I'll show you. So let's get an example that can't easily be written the other way, right? Um, so that would be like, um, so I want to have a self intersection here. So imagine that I gave you, um, uh, I said this, I'm going to give you a, a problem to do, right? So um, find the double integral over D of F the A where f of x, y is equal to uh, 2x, pretty easy. And d is the region bounded by um, uh, y is equal to x squared minus x, sorry, x minus x squared. And um, X squared minus X. There's, I said that somebody get, comes along, kick over a brick on a sidewalk, and there's an integral sitting underneath that just begging to be done, right? Get home at two o'clock in the morning and 
roommate sitting around watching terrible television. Oh, so um, so there you are, right? They're staring at this thing, and you're on the hook now because hey, you're in you're in vector analysis. You know everything. <laughs> Just do more math. It'll, it'll just happen to you. We all go crazy somewhere doing our PhDs. So if you actually plot this region here, what you're going to find is that this is a parabola that has points of, it opens downward, and it has points of intersection at zero and one, right? This is X times one minus X. And, it, like, and that's a parabola that looks like this, right? Here to here. So this is Y is equal to X minus X squared. And if you plot the other parabola, you get this. This is Y is equal to X squared minus, one, X, minus X. Same X intercept, right? So the problem is, so what type of integral is this one? Well, it always has the same function on top and it has the same function on bottom. So I could always do it as a type one integral because I know that I've got a top function and a bottom function and I could integrate from zero. So when I look at this, thinking of this as a function of type one where I've got a top and a bottom that are always the same, I'd say, okay, well, first I'm gonna integrate along a strip that looks like this, which means I would integrate y values that started at x squared minus x and finished at x minus x squared of f. And I would, that would be a, D, uh, a dy integral. And then once I did that, I would integrate through x from zero to one. Integrate the y's because you have a consistent relationship between the top and the bottom all the way down. And then when you're finished, you get each to, to add all those slices up, then you integrate from zero to one, which tells you where all those were located, right? Can you switch this one? It would be a hell of a lot of work, right? Because the problem is now this thing has the same function down to the top and bottom, and also it changes definition from here to here. So now you're taking about talking about taking a problem that's a, that's a one integral problem and decomposing it into at least a two integral problem. Right? Because if you turn it first off, despite the fact, I mean, even worse than that, this at least in principle, you could undo this with completing the square. Right? Because you have to solve this for x. If you want to think about this in the other direction, you can't have y as a function of x. You need x as a function of y to work in the other way. So let's think about what it would take to set this up as a type of integral. This one is doable. You can actually do this as a type two because you can say, well, this function right here and this function right here. Well, I've got the rectangles that go this way go between the top branch of x is equal to, okay, well, let's see, y is equal to uh, x minus x squared. This is minus y is equal to x squared minus x. Between minus y plus a quarter is equal to x squared minus x plus a quarter which means minus y plus a quarter is equal to x minus one half squared. So minus y plus a fourth uh, underneath the square root plus or minus is equal to x minus one half. So x is equal to one half plus or minus the square root of minus y plus one fourth. So you integrate from, from the negative branch of that to the positive branch, right? So half of the integral, half of the integral would be gotten by integrating from, um, let's see, we go minus one half minus the square root of minus y plus the fourth to minus one half plus the square root of minus y plus the fourth of f. And then that's a d, a dx integral. And then you have to integrate from all the from zero up to wherever this vertex is. So the vertex halfway between. So it's one half. We put the one half in here to get the y value. One half minus a quarter is a one fourth. Okay, so it's this integral. That's half of the integral. Then you've got to do one for the bottom half too, where you do the same trick, right? So the idea here is in principle, this could be done, but it can only be done because this is quadratic and you could actually invert the equation. No, because this function, the F that I gave you, this is not symmetric. So no, you can't do that. You can't integrate both halves at the same time. All I've done here is this part. Because on the bottom half, these are not the functions anymore. It's a different oh, set of functions that, that bound the lower area. So you plug them in. Only if you only if you prove that this function is symmetric across the x-axis, which it's not. Right? 
So the idea is, in principle, this could be done, but you wouldn't want to because this is dead easy. This is a dead easy way of characterizing this domain, and this is a terrible way of cutting it up, right? And in fact, we can be worse than this. What if instead of telling you that I had, um, I had squared functions here, what if I put cubes? So go ahead, I got a challenge for you. Suppose exactly the same question, except now, you know, let's, let's, let's do a question that, that literally cannot be undone. Oh, what if I wrote, let's see, I want you to find, uh, what's a good one here? How about um, between, so y is equal to x to the third minus x. Right? So now we've got this guy. So x to the third minus x um, is x squared minus one times x, which is x plus one times x minus one times x. So that goes like this. It comes up and then down and then up again. I say, I want you to integrate on that region right there. Right? I say do that. Find me the double integral over that region right there of the function here, of one, just a function one. Find me the integral of the function one, dA. If you do it in the, in the easy way here, it's, well, it's the integral from, zero, from minus one to zero, because that's minus one and that's zero. And then I'm integrating from the x-axis up to the function. So it's from the x-axis up to x to the third minus x of one. I integrated in the y direction first. And then I integrated out the x values. Super easy to set this integral up in this way. Now, challenge is, what if you wanted to reverse this and do it the other way? Do you guys even know how to invert this? Solve, OK, there you go. There's the challenge. Solve for x. Now, what you learned was, oh, you just switch the x and the y and solve the y. Well, OK, how do you do that? Do you know a completing the cube formula that I don't know? So the point is that this doesn't have an inverse that you can write down in closed form. And they, the, as soon as you put anything other than a square in here, there's no technique for undoing this. So this is a solidly type one question. There's no way to escape it. If you try to view it the other way, you're going to go nuts. It cannot be done in the other way without using numerics of some kind. Because there's no way to flip this around so that you think of this as a left function and a right function. To do that, you'd have to figure out what this cut point was and locally find the inverse of this function so you can write x as a function of y on both sides. I have no idea how to do that. I don't know how to isolate x in this. There is. I'm sort of. I'm. I'm, I'm building up to the. I'm, I was like. So you. you so. In theory, this can locally be inverted, right? There is a cubic root theorem that you can use to sort of like undo this, right? But even then it doesn't quite work because you get three different roots. So how are you going to write down the, the reason this works in the quadratic case is because you can complete the square and isolate one copy of X inside of the square. This doesn't have repeated roots. And there's, there is a cubic formula, but you can't do it. And in fact, if this was a sine or a cosine or something transcendental, there literally is no way to do it. Like if I put something like x plus the sine of 2x here, you're just screwed. There's nothing to be done. There's exactly one way to look at the problem. Yep. So if the person's just like, not saying what to say, then you would just say, like, you maybe just say that. Yes. Okay. Yeah. So, so, the point of, yeah, so the point of identifying the regions is sometimes you can get flexibility by switching the way you look at it, but only if you know that you can do that because of the way the region is set up. Okay. Do they have any other groups? Um, I mean, essentially, no. Yeah, I guess the idea is that like classifying the way the regions are. Um, so, no, I mean, I'm, I'm, all I'm doing is replicating a bunch of theory that you guys learned in 241, which is that there's three types of iterated integrals, yeah. right? And that double integrals like will always boil down to one of them, as long as the domains are nice enough. And if not, you've got to use numerics anyway. So, okay. Um, okay. So this is this is one of my this is a good example. Let's look at this integral. Let's see if we can interpret what this, what's going on here. So somebody comes along and says, 
I got this integral I need. This, this, this idea that we're talking about now, this comes up all the time. So again, we're solidly into what we've been discussing. All this stuff with switching the order of integration is the content of 5.3. This is another example from 5.3, which is called changing order of integration. Changing order. Sometimes you can do it. Sometimes you can't. Sometimes it's necessary to do it. So I write that integral down in front of you. Suppose, let's just hypothetically suppose that you're having an exam in this class, hypothetically. And you get an integral down on the page that looks impossible. Why does it look impossible? Do you know how to integrate cosine of x squared? No, you've never done that. You know why I know you've never done that? <laughs> because that has no closed form integral. There's no answer, none. That doesn't have an answer. You've done cosine squared of x, but not cosine of x squared. You've never done that. You can't, right? So like the way you learn to deal with this in, in calculus three was you turn into a power series and you integrate the power series and you get out at the end, doesn't have a closed form, okay? So maybe if you were lucky, maybe if you're lucky, we could draw the region we're integrating over and switch the order of integration. Because if that was just a, a, like a, if I could somehow undo this, maybe I could make that disappear. We can make the x squared disappear. X squared? Yeah. But doesn't that function doesn't matter? We can change the order of y squared and y. And well, because sometimes what ends up happening is if you change the order of integration, the integration actually unlocks. You end up getting a piece you might need for a u substitution, for example. Right? So right now, the way this is done, y is a constant. You can't do anything with it. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to write down the region of integration for this score. I'm going to draw a picture of the domain of this thing. <laughs> and then we'll see what happens if we switch the order. Like on an exam, if you get an impossible question, would I actually give you an impossible question? What's that? In the, in the cosine? Um, what did I screw it up? No, it's it's y squared of four, four. zero to two. It's right. Oh, I think so. Oh, 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 oh. Sorry, four, four. Yeah, that was my bad handwriting. Thanks for catching that. Okay, so what is the region that we're looking at here? Are these functions y four and how? Not, okay, then that's where you have to be careful. These values, are they X values or Y values? They're X values, right? So this is telling you that one of the functions is X is equal to Y squared, and the other function is X is equal to four. They're X values because they're attached to a DX integral. So when you're plotting these things, you have to plot them like they're X is equal to functions of Y. I think that's what this looks like. X is equal to four. And um, X is equal to Y squared. But then we got a further specification, which is we only cared about the Y values that went from zero to two, right? The second part of the region is not just plotting the curves, but also plotting down. So we're integrating from here to here. But the y values we're actually integrating over start at y equals zero and end at y equals two. So the actual region we're integrating looks like this. It's just this part. We're integrating from here to here, and then we're doing slices that start at zero and end at two. So let's, re let's, let's rebuild this. Let's switch the order. How am I going to switch the order? So you write y equals x, x squared, and then well, not y equals x squared. If I invert this function, what comes out? If I want to think about this as function, no, I'm just uh, writing f again. You don't flip that, right? There's no flipping that's going to happen. What we're going to do is we're going to write instead of thinking about a right function and a left function. So right now, what we've got is a picture where we're thinking of x is equal to four on the right side. And we're thinking of x is equal to y squared as being on the left side. And what I want to do is I want to flip the way I'm thinking about this. But I'm thinking about the region that's cut up this way, 
right? And then I want to integrate these x values instead. So what y values do I integrate? Yep. Not zero to four. Not zero to four. So zero to root x. It's going to be y is equal to root x, right? If x is equal to y squared, then y equals root x. Yeah. Um, yeah, and then the x values that you're going to integrate for your x. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> So the, I, I like to build these from the inside out, right? So here you're integrating from zero to root x. Um, and then what kind of integral is that? Dy or dx? Well, this dy. is a dy integral. x squared dy. And then you wrap that with an integral that looks like zero to four dx. Now, have we gained anything by doing that? We gained the cosine x squared to be constant. That's right. And what's going to happen to the y when I integrate it? It's going to be a y squared, and I'm going to plug in a root x into it, which is going to give me the x that I need to do a u substitution on the second step. All right. So now this is sort of a carefully chosen example. So it's like magic, right? Oh, look, it's magic, right? If I do it this way, if you do this first integration here, you do the integral from zero to four. Now the cosine of x squared is constant because you're doing a dy integral. So you get one half of y squared cosine of x squared evaluated from zero to root x. And then all that integrated dx eventually. This turns into um, the integral from zero to four of one half x cosine of x squared dx. So we've <coughs> engineered this x that we need to do a substitution. Now I know this example probably seemed artificial, right? Like, oh, what you just picked it so it would work this way. So a lot of higher level techniques in working with these ideas in calculus comes from actually taking a problem and forcing it to manipulate so that this can happen, right? That sometimes, like, that you get these common things show up in practice where flipping the order of integration actually makes it significantly easier in both to do. It. Now, of course. In practice, nobody does anything by hand, right? Everything is on the computer. So the idea is less that you will ever be doing this computation and more that like the idea of flipping the way that you're looking at a domain, even if you never actually go through the process of writing down one of these integrals by hand, because I mean, I do use substitutions because I teach it, right? Nobody in real life uses sub uses use substitutions, right? You just Look it up at a table or a computer tells you what the integral of something is or you're working numerically but the idea of switching the perspective on the domain you're working on is a key idea in a lot of contexts right maybe i can reverse the way i think about it and i go from a basically impossible problem to one that's not impossible especially if you're looking for an analytic solution and not one that's a numerical solution numerical solutions are good enough in a lot of cases but they're not always so i hope from here i hope you know what just because just because just because I'm here. I'm going to finish. I, I haven't done an integral all the way through yet. So I'm just going to do one. I'm going to finish this up for you. Yep. Have you gone through the margin of like some graphics or something? Where I got, yeah. So this is y equals zero to y equals root x. And this was x equals zero to x is equal to four is the other integration. So the zero to root x comes from integrating this way. And the zero to four says after I have the slices where the slice is located, they live like this. You do usually, yeah. Because a lot of times what will happen is domains will be constructed with, you won't be able to tell by looking at the functions if they curl over on themselves or where the points of intersections are. So even if you're gonna do it numerically, it's almost always a good idea to visualize the domain you're working on. So in this case, visualizing the domain lets us see, oh, I can think about it either way without any complications, right? Which is sometimes important for numerics too. In other cases, visualizing the domain is gonna show you symmetries. And anytime you have symmetry, you wanna take advantage of it, right? And the only way to see, unless you guys have amazing ability to see graphs of functions, maybe you do. I, very well, you guys are all Cal Poly. You must be able to just visualize functions, right? Um, that uh, sometimes that symmetries will become apparent in a graph that you won't see otherwise. And when symmetries are present, you should use them. Okay, so let's finish this up because why not? Let's just do a let's do an end of 141. Uh, I know all of you just sit around all day remembering everything from calculus 141. But just to remind the couple people in here that maybe haven't done this in a while. 
the way that you do an integral like this, for example, if you're being asked to do an exam because I have to evaluate you on something, Now, as sophisticated connoisseurs of calculus, nobody is going to do a u substitution, find the antiderivative, and change variables back to plug in the original bit, the original limits of integration. That would be nuts. Every single person in here, as a connoisseur of advanced techniques in calculus, is going to realize that what you should do is also change the limits of integration so you don't have to go backwards and risk making mistakes. Right? No? Nobody wants to do that? Please don't. Please don't do the antiderivative and go back and use your original limits of integration. I know sometimes it sucks, but like, you know, just, just feel free to, uh, you know, what, what's your favorite technique here? You need a one half right there. So just take a, a one fourth right here, and put a one half right here. How do you do your algebra? Do your substitutions. This is this should be like a walk in the park, right? It's like a refreshing, it's like an iced tea on a summer day. You just like say, oh, look at that. I just have the integral from 0 to 16 of one fourth of the cosine of u du. And then and then you know, then you say, do I have to keep going? And I say, well, yeah, you gotta go at least as far enough. Where do you get the one fourth on your x now? Well, if du is equal to two x dx. Then one half of a du is equal to x dx, but, but there's an x dx right there. Right? Oh, okay. yeah. Yeah. I mean, I'm lazy, so I just divided by the one fourth, so I saw the one half x dx. Right? Oh, yeah. Okay, so it's one fourth the sine of u value of zero to sixteen. Now, if you really don't have any pride in yourself, you are more than welcome to write down the sine of zero and then just leave it if you have no dignity. Mm -hmm. But when you have a zero sitting there all gussied up like a sine of zero, you might take the chance to just write down one fourth times the sine of 16. Mm, that'd be cool. You don't have to. Though. I think when you're actually computing these things, if you got here, you'd be finished. Okay. So remember that you substitute, what is the point of all that? Remember that you substitution exists. It is a thing. It can be done. It's a basic technique that I expect everyone in here to be able to regurgitate basically on one. If you do not remember how u substitution works, please let me know so that we can go through, um, or, or we have, just have to practice. Okay, so the last thing that we need to talk about, all right, before I go on, are there questions about double integration? This is basically all double integral theory, right? So double integral theory is you have double integrals over, <coughs> over areas, they convert to, um, they convert to, Iterated integrals. We haven't really talked about change of variables yet, but we have talked about switching limits of integration. So, lurking somewhere out there in the future is the idea what does u substitution look like if you have two variables to work with instead of one? That's a question we're going to answer. Uh, every, this, u sub, yeah, this u substitution we use right here is just a one variable substitution as part of an iterated integral. My question is, and one of the big questions we want to answer. Is, is there a way to do u substitution in several variables? So one of the things we want to think about is, what if I had something like x, y, and I let that become x, r, cosine theta, sine theta, r. But if I started with an r theta, I wrote down r cosine theta and r sine theta and use that to get coordinates x and y. It's kind of like a u substitution, right? I'm switching x and y out and putting r, switching r and theta out and putting x and y in their place. If I did this, what are these called? Polar coordinates. <laughs> So, let's talk for a second about what DA means. So, we've been writing this down. Okay, I'm going to sully myself by 
using differentials here. We've been writing dA is equal to either dx dy or dy dx. What do we actually mean by that? Like, what do we mean when I say a little tiny amount of area is equal to a little tiny change in x times a little tiny change in y? How do I intuitively think about what I'm doing when I do that? A little rectangle. Yeah, it's little itty bitty like like rectangles or squares or something like that, right? We're saying that I can think about cutting a region up into little itty bitty pieces that look like this, and no matter where you move, dy dx is the same shape everywhere, right? Like cutting up areas into little tiny bits is equivalent to cutting them up into these little itty bitty squares that are. It's making me sick just writing this dx dy on the side, right? But little tiny change in x, little tiny change in y, right? The, to say, cut this up into little bits of area, if I'm in x and y coordinates and I cut this thing up, it's saying, oh, you could just do that, right? Take your coordinate system and chop it up into little itty bitty squares. And no matter where you move inside the region, the size of any square is the size of any other square, right? As Euclidean coordinates are awesome. Little areas are, are the same shape no matter where you put them. Okay. So somebody comes along and says, well, I mean, suppose you have a circle. I mean, this is kind of a crappy way to cut a circle up, right? We're not taking advantage of the fact it's a circle. Yeah, fine, you got these squares that are the same everywhere, but like, it's a circle. Why would I want to cut it up into these? Maybe instead of working in Euclidean coordinates, I should cut it up into more appropriate coordinates. So to remind you, the way the polar coordinate system works, it's like this, you have radial circles and you have angles, right? And a point is located on a polar coordinate plane. Actually, the classrooms in here used to have these like as part of the chalkboards and we don't anymore, which is too bad. Because um, I would use it right now. So the idea here is that a polar coordinate is located at some point on this and it's identified by a radius, which tells you how far you move from the origin and an angle that tells you the angle that you've rotated around from the positive x-axis to get to the point that you're at. So the polar coordinates are a way of locating yourself with respect to a radius and an angle. Now, as opposed to Cartesian coordinates, where you have an x value that tells you how far to go this way and a y value that tells you how far to go up, x, y. You don't say anything about the area of the squares in this lattice that the coordinate system breaks up here versus the area of pieces that the polar coordinate system chops the plane up into. Like every one of these little squares, if I think about this as being very small, every one of these squares is the same. It doesn't matter where I'm located in space. Every square determined by the coordinate system has the same shape. If I cut it up into pieces this wide, every square has the same area. If I cut the polar plane up into pieces that are all equidistant from each other, so radiuses are all the same distance apart, and the angle lines are all the same distance apart, those are not the same shape anymore. The area of this piece out here, even though I use angle lines that were equidistant all the way around and radius lines that were equidistant, the area of this guy is different than the area of the same one in here for a different radius, right? So if I cut a circle up into pieces, if I cut a circle up into pieces that look like this, I mean, super natural, a circle in, a circle in polar coordinates is amazing, right? R equals whatever, two, five. So you take this thing and you say, oh, well, a better way to cut this up would be to cut it up like this to figure out its area. Chop it up into equally spread angle lines, and then I'm going to chop it up into equally spread radius lines. And look at that, I made it. I have a perfectly regular way of cutting the circle up where um, it's natural, it curves at the edges. It's perfect. Except, except over here, PA was the X to Y because literally every square had the same area no matter where it was located. A little tiny area didn't depend on anything about where the square was. <clears throat> so, just off the top of their head, any of you guys remember what VA is equal to in this setup? R 
PR d theta. Why on earth is that true? We're getting there. The Jacobian is coming. We can't set. We're gonna when we do change of variables, we're gonna talk about the Jacobian. But we can do this interpret. This is sort of motivates why, why the Jacobian works. Okay. So the idea is what you're measuring here. When you're measuring, why when you do an integral in polar coordinates, you have to use the r dr d theta is because this is an estimate for how large the area of this little curved chunk is. The idea is this thing, the size of these changes depending on where you're located in the polar plane. In here, you're very small compared to the same shape, you know, same shape polar chunk out here. Little tiny slivers that are near the origin turn into like enormous pieces when you're far away. Yep. They, and that's literally what's happening. You can draw a picture of like why this happens, where it's, I mean, you can actually write down the formula for what's actually, what's actually happening here, right? So if you actually, if you write down, um, if you think about it as a rectangle, so just imagine for a second, that's theta right there, right? How long is this arc right here? So you're located a distance of r away. This is r d theta in length. That's the arc length formula, right? Radius times angle tells you what arc length is in polar coordinates. So the length of that side is this. So for a small enough change in radius, it's basically a rectangle. So what we're saying is basically, this rectangle out here, I know it's not really a rectangle, but it kind of looks like it. What's that? DR. DR. We think about it as sort of, it's a rectangle, but the size of the, the, the width of the rectangle scales with how far away the rectangle is from the origin, right? So the area of this we say is about equal to width times height. And all, it's okay. This kind of motivates the idea of Maybe we need to come up with a way of, I mean, there's a something that's happened here where this the way that we compute area, this little changes in area. Is that DA? Yeah, this is DA. No, yeah, what I mean is yeah, little tiny areas about equal to this. Yeah. Right. And if it was in here, of course, it would be smaller because the radius is smaller in here, right? So as this thing slides out, the area gets bigger. Even though the R and the theta don't change, the R and the theta don't change. The actual radius expands the rectangle as you go up. So the idea is that two variable and three variable change of coordinates involve something deeper than just a u substitution. What's going on here is we're translating the notion of infinitesimal area depends on the way we set the coordinate system up. So the three dimensional coordinate systems are used all over the place. So eventually what we're going to do is we're going to come up with a way of measuring what the change in area is that corresponds to different ways of arranging a coordinate system. So those of you that whoever it was that shouted out Jacobian, absolutely that's the thing that's coming. So there's a there, basically there's a way of, of defining a matrix of derivatives that tells us what the relationship is between, I mean, these are both DA. They both measure little tiny areas, but in some coordinate systems, what that means. Uh, matters, right? DA could be, it's invariant, you're the same everywhere, or DA could be, yeah, you actually have to know something about where you're located to tell. The three-dimensional coordinate systems, the common ones, are not just, they're not polar, there's also cylindrical, where a point is given to you by a polar coordinate and also a height, and then the devil's own coordinate system, spherical coordinates, which are given to you in terms of a radius and two angles. It's too bad spherical coordinates are so useful. I don't know why anybody wants to work in them otherwise. But the idea is that in each of those cases here, your little d, if you can imagine, there's a dv, a little change in volume. And what does it look like? Well, there's going to be kind of a curved piece and a curved piece and then a dz chunk. And that is very much going to depend on um, you know, these sort of like curved cylindrical pieces are going to change based on how far away you are from the origin. And in spherical coordinates, you get these even weirder things because they're kind of like three dimensional. I can't even draw it. It's like take a sphere and shoot lines out so that you get a 
piece on the edge that looks like this, where it's kind of curved on both sides and then come down to sort of a, a sort of weird cone thing. So it's a chunk of a sphere. So a DV unit in the sphere case is going to have like, I don't know, like a, a tooth or something. That's the worst analogy I could possibly have come up with. I don't know. It looks teeth. That's right. It looks like teeth. I'm not sleeping. So anyway, so we're going to talk about. So next time what we're going to talk about it is I'm going to remind you guys how trip how like sort of like with the setup for triple integrals the relationship with volume, and then we're going to start talking about the most important idea in here, which is change of coordinates and the Jacobian to keep track of what happens in the area when you move from one coordinate system to another. All right. See you guys.